Kyle, welcome to the Men Made For More podcast. Man, I'm really stoked to have you on here today and I uh, appreciate you taking some time to be on. Yeah, man, I'm excited about it. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to get to come here and, and talk to you for a minute. Yeah, it's gonna be gonna be good. So why don't you uh, why don't you just start by giving a little background of your story, personally, professionally, where you're at, what you're up to right now? Well, I don't um, I don't know how much time I've got, but <laughs> better rip. Uh, so in August, actually, I stepped down from um, full time youth ministry, which is something I'd done for the past seven years, and so stepped down to do what I'm doing now. My full time job now is um, I'm the operations manager for physical therapy biz training, also known as PT biz. And uh, that's where you and I know each other from. And um, I think we, we connected in the past too, you know, with something else, but, um, but that's where we work together from now. And, um, but so I, I work at home now, work online and that's where I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting in my office in my gym at my house. And um, I'm also, so that's my full-time job. And I'm also a part-time fitness coach for End of Three Fitness, which is an online fitness company. And um, so I've been with them. I've been a coach with them, part of the coaching team for two years now. And um, before that, I was an athlete. I followed their programming and stuff. And so I've been I've been with End of Three Fitness for over three years, going on four years. But I've been a coach for over two years. So went from um, went from having three jobs down to two. I'm only at two jobs now. <laughs> Keeping it lean right now. What was yeah, the, yeah. What was the transition from? Because because how long were you doing ministry stuff before you got into the the fitness world? There was that something that came because you were already an athlete with Garage Gym Athlete. Is that is that sort of how that transition came to be, or did you always have a passion in fitness? I definitely did not always have a passion in fitness. So uh, my fitness background it goes back to goes back to high school. I played football in high school and middle school, and so I did you know the the good old football strength coach training, you know what I mean? Which is hit or miss. And mine was a lot of miss, it turns out. But um, but after high school, I, working out was something that I did for football. And so once I wasn't playing football anymore, it just wasn't really anything. I didn't really see the point in it. And so um, fast forward to 2017 and – I'm married and we have our first child and I'm weighing more than I've ever weighed before. And, um, you know, it was getting hard to walk upstairs and getting hard to move around and stuff. And I was just kind of sick of that. And so I had tried a bunch of different programs, a bunch of different free things and had a buddy of mine that had a garage gym and, uh, he was doing CrossFit in the garage gym. I tried some CrossFit with him. Didn't really like it. Never really had liked CrossFit, but, um, I could do free stuff at his gym, you know, and free programming, but I just, I wasn't sticking with it. And I found into three fitness online and, um, read one of Jared's articles and Jared's the founder and CEO of into three fitness and, um, just signed up for their program and signed up for their coaching course and actually started putting some money into it. And that kind of kept me accountable. You know, I'm finally spending some money. And at that time, you know, that, that money was, um, it was, you know, we had to move some stuff around, you know, to be able to afford it. And so I was like, you know, um, this is going to keep me accountable. And sure enough, it did. And I lost, uh, I think, 65 pounds and got down to where I need to be. And then I became a coach for them. And now that's where I'm at now. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty fun thing. Never would have expected to be a fitness coach. And, um, but it, you know, life comes at you fast, you know, things change. Yeah, definitely. What what point was there a point along there where you knew the transition from okay, I lost this weight, I'm getting I'm getting more fit that you wanted to be a coach or was it more of a kind of slow onset or was there like a certain point where you're like, yes, this is something I want to get more involved with? So really, my life is just kind of and we'll talk we'll talk about this more, you know, moving forward here, but my life has just kind of been a lot of opportunities presenting themselves and then me just kind of taking advantage of the opportunities when they come along. Um, I'm not really much of a planner. And so, you know, having a plan, you know, or like putting myself on a trajectory, you know, to be a certain place or to reach a certain place or achieve a certain thing, it's not really, not really my thing. And so uh, the the good Lord has blessed me with, you know, a lot of opportunities to just kind of, Hey, you know, this is where you need to go with this. And, 
now are you actually going to do it and follow through with it? And so that's kind of what happened here. I, I, when I first joined up, I honestly didn't expect to actually stick with it, which is what I had, you know, that had been my experience the entire time of trying to lose weight and stuff. I didn't expect to actually stick with it, but I did. And then um, the opportunity presented itself to, you know, take the coaching course and become a coach. And um, so that was really cool. And so I, I took advantage of that and, then the opportunity presented itself not just to be a coach but to be part of the coaching team at EO3 and so I took advantage of that as well and um, that's just kind of led to where I am now you know just kind of um, blessings and opportunities coming my way and and I just I just take advantage of them luckily uh, I've got somebody looking out for me you know that knows that <laughs> if I don't if I don't have somebody pushing me the right way you know I'm not going to go the right way so um, that's that's just kind of how it's worked out for me. Right. And that's, that's so cool to hear. And it's, it's cool to hear your, you know, just obedience with that, or what I say, just kind of leaning into those opportunities, because, you know, I, I want to just, it's, it's a huge, uh, you know, credit to you to be able to follow that, because a lot of people want to, you know, maybe be in a position where, you know, for in your case, want to be a coach within a three fitness, want to do these things, but they don't want to take the steps of, hey, maybe I should start by being an athlete, and then I need to go through their program. And, and you're, you know, you're just following what the next step is versus trying to plan out and say like, this is where I need to be. And this is what I think I need to be doing and jump, trying to jump ahead to step Z before taking all those other steps. And as I'm sure you've seen, and, and maybe you can speak on this, but as you take the little step, then that's when these doors start to open. It's not, it's not like you, you know, had this end and dream in mind. And then you just went and went and got it. It's sort of this slow obedience that over time has led to where you are now. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having plans. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with being prepared for things or setting yourself up for things. I mean, that that's certainly the way that it should be, you know, and, and, you know, within that time, you know, I guess I kind of glossed over it and made it seem kind of easy, you know, but within that time, you know, there was, there was, there were things that I had to do to, to continue in that, you know, there were things that I had to do to actually bring that about, you know, it was like the opportunity presents itself, but, but you have to take advantage of it, you know, and then once you've, taking that step you have to keep taking the steps to stay there you know and and so that things don't fizzle out and so it you know i i think it's i think it's really good to to have plans and to to be strategic and to try to put yourself in good situations but at the same time you have to understand that it's like i said you know life comes at you fast you know there's and there's a lot of things that are out of your control and there are a lot of things that you just need to understand they're just going to happen to you and and just go with it. You know what I mean? Have something that, that you can trust that's going to guide you forward and, and you just go with it. And that's just kind of, that's kind of how I've, how I've lived my life. I've been really blessed and fortunate up to this point. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great too. I like actually said, there's nothing wrong with plans, but I think, I think people get caught waiting for the perfect opportunity and then they fail to act on so many good opportunities and and, you know, when you get to it, when you get to a certain level, maybe you can say no to the good opportunities, but when you're just starting out and you're kind of figuring out what to do, yeah. you just got to start taking on opportunities, whether they look good, whether they look like, instead of just, you know, you can have these plans of where you want to be, but still that, that bias towards action of just being like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to try this and, and see what comes of it. Yeah. You got to get out there and, and you got to fail fast. You know what I mean? And that's, that's definitely something that anybody that's successful, you know, I'm not saying that I'm successful, but I'm just saying anybody that's successful, that's something that you see, you know, as they, they try hard at something and it doesn't work. And the difference between them and the people who don't succeed are, are they just keep trying, you know, okay, well, this doesn't work. Well, I'll go try this, you know, and they fail fast and they learn fast. And I think that's, that's something as well. Like have, have a, have an outline, but, you know, don't make it a roadmap. You know what I mean? Don't mm -hmm. be like, like there's, there's a bunch of different ways to get where you're trying to go. And, and before you get there, you may realize there's a better place to go anyway. And so you, you divert and go a different direction. And so it's just, um, ha have, have some plans put together, but just be flexible, you know, and, and be ready to be ready to take advantage of opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Love that. And I think people are afraid to fail because they think it's, it's final. If they fail, it's like, yeah. well, that door is permanently closed. And it's like, no, that might just mean you have to, you might just be a, you know, a hair off or, or a little, you know, a little, a pivot away from, from moving in the direction that you really want to be heading. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, even if that door does close, okay, that one's closed, go find another one. You know, there's a bunch of doors out there. And so maybe that's just not how things were supposed to work out or, or, you know, whatever you want to believe, you know, about it, but just, just don't, don't stop moving, you know, just, just keep going and, and be ready for those opportunities when they come up. 
So, yeah. you know, mic drop. I think we can just end it here. And, yeah. you know, we got everything. Yeah, we're just talking, <laughs> everything we're gonna, we're we gonna, need. We're going to close this one off today. And we'll just, uh, <laughs> if you guys have any questions, you can reach out to Kyle. And no, that's great. And when we were talking about where to, you know, I, I love your your background here with all the things you've mentioned and you've had a bunch of jobs and you have your, your ministry side and you're a father, you're in the fitness thing now, you're in more of the business world now. You, you've just, all these experiences are really awesome to be able to pull from. And, and I'm excited to hear some of your knowledge today. And when we were talking about kind of which, which direction we wanted to, to take it, it I, you know, I, the, the first, first thing that came to mind too, is just seeing, being in a position of influence. And as men, we, whether we realize it or not, we're in this position of, of influence. We're in this position where we're leading our families, we're leading in our workplace, where we have this incredible opportunity to impact other people, and I don't think men realize the impact that our words have, that our actions carry. And as you, you know, with your kind of vast background, I'm, I'm excited to, to hear what you think on this, but I, I think our, you know, our words carry so much weight, our actions carry so much weight, whether it's in the household, whether it's in the workplace. And I kind of want to hear what you think on, with the pressure we face as men, you know, especially for a lot of the guys listening here, we, we have a lot of pressures in our workplace, in our households to perform to be you know doing all these things with all the pressures we face as men trying to lead try to provide trying to just live out our lives in this crazy world how do you stay grounded and, and where do you stay find your focus on you know what really matters most with all these things you have going on so i think i think you and and i think a lot of people say this but but really you need to there's there's two things that i think are are important uh one of them is you need to have a why and I think that's what helped me with with finally sticking with you know a program and, and losing weight and and things like that and and getting in in better physical shape and just being able to live a better life you know is is there was a why there you know up until then it just really hadn't dawned on me you know that other people were dependent on me you know what I mean even with with being married you know my wife and I were married for you know a little over two years before we had a kid you know what I mean and so it was like even with that, you know, I wasn't really, wasn't really concerned with it. You know what I mean? But then this, this little life comes along, you know what I mean? And like, I'm responsible for it now, you know, and, you know, to, to be what I needed to be for him and for, and for our, our daughter that came later, um, I, I needed to be in better shape. You know what I mean? It wasn't really about, you know, looking good or anything like that. I mean, that's a plus, but, um, you know, it, it was about you have you have a responsibility here and so I think having a why is what what drove me to to actually sticking with it and that's kind of what has helped me through all the big decisions I've had to make all the transitions that we've made recently all those things is is why I do things and why whatever it is that I'm doing I know the reason and I know what it what is bringing me back to the other thing I think that you need is you need something that um, is bigger than you you need to put your trust and put your faith in something that's bigger than you. And, and for me, obviously, you know, coming from a ministry background, you know, I was raised in a Christian home, you know, for me, uh, that thing is God, you know what I mean? That thing is my, my faith goes to him and, um, my wife and I, that's what brought us together. We were to get, we met at a campus ministry in college, you know what I mean? And so our entire relationship has been based on our, our common faith that we share. And so, that's something that keeps me grounded as well as I know there's something bigger than me and it's not just bigger than me. It's bigger than everything else. And, you know, some people don't believe that and some people do, and that's fine, you know, but it, you know, if God's not going to be your thing, then find something that's bigger than you, you know, because if it, if it's, if it's all about you, like you're life, you know, life's going to come at you fast, man. I'm going to say that again. You know what I mean? It's you're, you're going to find out real quick that, that the truth of it, you know, that, that life really isn't all about you and that, if you're the only thing you're leaning on that one day, you know, that's going to come crashing down and you're going to have a big moment of clarity. And so uh, those two things I think are, are what's helped me stay grounded is, is really my big why and not just my big why, but um, having something bigger to believe in and having God on my side and, and leading me through all those things. I love that. Yeah. Appreciate you sharing that. And the, uh, you know, for a lot of people, I, and it, and it, came for me in, in a humbling way when I was so self-absorbed and, and, you know, especially through my, you know, teens and even early on getting married through, through playing football before meeting my wife and, 
you know, before my relationship with God was like, I was just so self absorbed and it was just all Mm -hmm. about my path and these things. And I just continued to, to get humbled in different ways because you get these setbacks and then you're like, but why, like everyone else is slowing me down and like, it's always blaming on outside things. So it can't possibly be, be me. And it was just so self-centered that it's, it's, it's not a good place, good place to be. And I, I think that's, you know, I, I didn't really think about it that way until you, you mentioned it like you did, but it's, it's fun to look back and, and see how far I've come to from, from that side of things. And I'm sure a lot of guys listening can relate of when we try and do it all on our own, when we try and think it's all about us, we, we will fall short time and time mm-hmm. again, and it makes for frustrations and makes for all sorts of, all sorts of problems. I'm sure you've seen some too. Well, and, and I think something too, you know, being a Christian, putting your faith in God, you know, it doesn't take those things away. You know what I mean? It doesn't take those temptation, that temptation to, to make it all about you, you know, that temptation to, to blame other people or, or whatever it is, you know what I mean? It doesn't, you know, being, being a Christian doesn't make, you know, life all sunshine and rainbows, you know what I mean? But it gives you something to hold on to when those times come, you know what I mean? And I just, I can't imagine what it's like, for somebody that doesn't have something like that to put their faith in or put their hope and trust in, you know what I mean? When those times come, because if it really is, if you're all you're dependent on, what happens when you break, you know what I mean? You got nothing at that point. And so, you know, I think, I think it gets presented a lot that, um, that supposedly Christianity kind of alleviates all that, you know, it, it takes away all that suffering and all of that pain and all of that, you know, that um, confusion about life and, and it just makes everything, kicks and giggles and it's like it's it's the opposite man like life is still life you know what i mean but you have something stronger to to stand on and you have something to to hold on to you to pull you through it once you get to it and i think that's something too that we gotta that we have to acknowledge as well yeah no i love that and i want to circle back to when you're talking about finding your why when did you know when did you first realize the importance of actually you know tangibly doing this i think a lot of people out there listening would be like oh yeah i have a I have a bigger why or I have a why why I'm doing things, but I don't think many people actually like sit down and give it thought or put pen to paper. And what's, what's your process for maybe what was your early on process for actually discovering this? If you can speak a little on that and then how has it evolved over, over the years? So for me, it really was just the, Oh man, I've got a kid now. You know what I mean? It's like, I've got to stick around. You know what I mean? Like I can't, like we have stairs in our house. I'm going to have to go up and down these stairs every single day, multiple times a day. I can't be getting out of breath every time I get up there. You know what I mean? Like I just can't do that. And so for me, it really was just, um, just kind of boom, here it is. This is a big reason that you need to make this change. But since then, and especially with like our coaching that we do with into three fitness, something that we try to do with our athletes when we first, when we first onboard them, when they first sign up for coaching and things like that, we talk to them about, their goal but not just their goal but why that goal and we we try to go five wise deep that's what we call it five wise deep so you just keep asking the question you know well what's your goal well i want to lose weight okay why do you want to lose weight well i want to look better okay why is looking better important to you you know what i mean well this and this and this you know what i mean and and you get down to it and it's not just about us finding that out but it's about somebody else speaking it out loud you know what i mean and so I think that's something that's really helpful as well Is I mean, and you find your process, you know, maybe for some people it's writing it down. Maybe for some people it's talking to another person about it. Maybe for some people it's really just, just speaking it out loud to themselves. I talk to myself a lot. That's something that I help find that I find really helpful for myself, just kind of processing things, but, um, but do that five why process, you know, and, and say, okay, well, this is what I want to do. Well, but what's the real motivation of why I want to do that? And sometimes you get down to it and it's, it's something really superficial and you're like, man, is that really the reason I want to do this? And then you reconsider. It's like, maybe that's not something I need to go for. You know, maybe there's something bigger here that I need to do, you know, or maybe you get down four or five whys deep and you see, Oh, there's actually a deeper issue here. And maybe I need to focus on this issue before I get there, you know? And so um, that's kind of how it's evolved for me with the why it started out as just something just, bam, it's right there in my face. And then now it's like, it's much, much deeper than that, you know? And so I, I've, I've found that really helpful. Yeah. And I'm curious for you, is this a, is this something you still think about regularly now that you're in better shape? I know initially it was like, man, I'm getting winded going up the stairs. I gotta, 
I got to step it up now. I mean, now that you're in good shape and everything, is this still something you're revisiting? Yeah. Well, and that's, that's part of it. That's, that's evolved as well is it's not, it's not about me getting in shape now. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking good now, you know, I'm in good shape, but it's like, now it's something I need to pass on. You know what I mean? Now it's something that it's, it's a, it's a habit. It's a lifestyle. It's something that now my kids need to see from me, Mm -hmm. you know, and actually uh, my wife has joined the program too. She joined the program last year. And so she's like, she's destroyed me, man. Like she lost over 90 pounds, I think. And, you know, we're still, now we're both, you know, in this, where we, you know, we went on a, on a, and did a 5k run, you know, before Thanksgiving last week, you know, and it wasn't like an official race or anything. Like we just, we were at her parents' house for Thanksgiving and we just got out and we ran a 5k together. That's it. We just ran, you know, uh, two and a half K out, two and a half K back. Everything's good. You know what I mean? And that's, but that's a lifestyle that we have now. And we talk about that now and we plan things, you know, around that now. And that's something that our kids see. And so for me, it's, it's something that I'm passing on. It's not just something that, you know, eventually my wife joined in with by seeing what I was doing, but now it's going to be natural for my kids. You know, it wasn't natural for me. And so I don't want my kids to ever be in the position I was in. You know, I want my kids, I want wellness and health and fitness. I just want it to be natural for them, not just something they have to learn about. It, it's just how they live, you know. I want them, when they start going over to their, their friends' houses when they're older, you know, like the first thing they do is look for their gym. You know, if, if I'm spending the night at your house, where's your gym in your house? Oh, you don't have one? Maybe I shouldn't stay here. You know what I mean? Like, you guys are crazy. Why don't you have a gym in your house? You know, and, like I want that to be natural for them and so that's kind of it's evolved to that point of it's not just me doing something for me and me having this this one why now like my why is different my purpose is different now it's something that that I want to pass on to them and hopefully make it generational from there you know where it, it just continues to become something that's perpetuated over time it's that's breaking so, a cycle man just breaking yeah, a cycle that's so cool and it, it really is just breaking a cycle because a lot of people get you know, caught in, and in, in this can be health, this can be, you know, financial issues, this can be um, relational, relational issues or things that people, it's just, I, I know there's a lot that goes into it. I know it runs deep, but we do have the choice to, to make that change, make that yeah. stance, put our flag down in, in what we believe in. And there's no guarantee that it's going to change for generations to come, like you said, but it, it does start with someone making that change and being able to say yeah. like, Hey, I, I don't want to fall into the same cycle. I don't want to repeat the same thing. Like I want something better for my kids and grandkids and that. And it, it, it starts with a decision and, and yeah. you made that decision and it's cool to see your family following along with that. Yeah. It's um, I mean, if I panned around, you know, here in, in the gym, you know, you'd see a, a little trampoline over here. You'd see, I think you'd probably see some toys down here. You know, they, that I try to keep my gym picked up, you know what I mean? I don't pick up the rest <laughs> of the house, but I try to keep my gym picked up, you know, but you know, they, they get down here and they play around and, you know, it's just a natural thing for them. And that, and I just, I love that. You know what I mean? I, I like to see that. And that's just kind of, but that, that's something, especially the, the, the small town that I grew up in, it's not, there's a lot of things from there, you know, that I'd like to, you know, a lot of habits that I'd like to break a lot of cycles I'd like to break, but, but this is one of them, you know, is, is prioritizing, prioritizing your health and just, just keeping that, keep it, keeping them away from those kinds of things. That's, that's what I want to do. Yeah, that's great. And, and for being a, you know, like how you mentioned it, like instilling these habits and leading by example, what else is a, you know, as it relates to your kids, are you, how else are you trying to lead them in, in different ways? Maybe because setting a good example is a big one, but what other either challenges have you run into when it comes to, to raising your kids in the way that you're trying to, or what, you know, things have you found success with that, that are working well for raising them into the, the, you know, eventual kids and teens and adults that you want them to be? Well, I think a big challenge is finding other people around you that can help you. And, you know, that there's that old saying, you know, it takes a village, right? And that really is true. You know, if, if you're trying to raise your kids in isolation, you're actually doing them a disservice, in my opinion. I th- they need to be around some other people. They need to, you know, that's, it's kind of like what I was talking about earlier before we started recording, you know, we, we're going to a new church now. And I think the biggest thing that's been a real help for us is getting to be part of a, a new small group. And it's a small group of people that are our age and whose kids are our kids age, you know what I mean? And they get to be around 
people who are like-minded, but people who come from different backgrounds and they, you know, that they have different philosophies in parenting, you know what I mean? And so the, the kids that they're playing with, you know, they, they act differently and they, they have a good, a good solid place to kind of learn how to be people, you know what I mean? And to learn from different perspectives and, and think, you know, they're, they're four and two, so they're not really, you know, they're learning, you know what I mean? But it's not like really on a really deep level yet, but it's still like building that foundation of, of having people around them that can, can help raise them and can bring them to the place that you want them to be. And I think that's an important thing is, as parents is, is you need to find people who are like-minded with you and that can pour into you that way. And that can teach you different things about life and give you fresh perspective, but who also have kids that can, can interact with your kids in that way. And y'all just kind of be in that little community, you know, together. And so, you know, obviously for us, you know, we, we find that at church and we want our kids to be around, you know, other Christian parents. We want our kids to be around other Christian kids, you know, and that's, that's part of it. It's not just raising them in isolation, but I think that's whatever your philosophy is, you know, or whatever it is that you're doing, you know, find other people around you that that fit that you know and that can model that for your kids too because raising them in isolation is just it's no good you're doing them a disservice by doing that i love that it's such an important message in today's world too right now with everything yeah. going on of isolation and yeah. uh, finding ways to community have you run any challenges with that with having to uh, kind of being forced in isolation with with all this stuff going on yeah you know Birthday parties look different this year. You know, our birthday parties for our kids are typically a lot bigger than they were this year. You know, and, um, we usually have them out in a public place and, you know, their little friends come and all that kind of stuff and didn't do it that do that this time. And, you know, even even church, you know, church just looks different. You know, the, um, going and going to worship assemblies you know it's just it's just different you know you you got masks on and you know i could go on about the masks you know and stuff all day i'm not going to do that but you know it's kind of um I, i'm kind of wary about you know kids being normalized to that you know i don't i don't like that you know masks are just kind of normal to them you know and my wife's a fourth grade teacher and you know that's how they are you know they're kind of collecting them like like baseball cards or something you know oh man look at this new mask i've got i'm like no that's not okay you know but at, at the same time you know you find ways to get around that and i think something even in you know before i left my ministry job you know, we were having to do Bible classes and stuff on Zoom and we were having to do, you know, our our worship assemblies we were having to do through Zoom, you know, and people were having to live stream them instead of being together and, and things like that. And it was like it showed me that even in this this age that we have where we're we're so heavy into the digital side, you know, and we're, we're growing that technological um, that technological base where where people are just, they're using technology for everything, you know, when it comes down to it, where it's like, well, now you have to worship together digitally, or now you have to see each other only digitally. And it's like, no human beings need human beings. You know, they need to be, we need to be around each other. You know, we need to be in close proximity. We need to be looking at each other face to face. We need to be picking up on nonverbal cues. You know, we need to be experiencing things together. And that just reinforced to me that, as as much as we depend on technology for so many things it's like technology is never going to replace human connection you know what i mean we still need it and um so that's something that's that's something that stuck out to me with all this stuff going on it's it's crazy but we still need each other you know what i mean we still need to be around each other yeah i love yeah i love i think technology can enhance relationships in a lot of ways of if you already yeah. i noticed that you know, the relationships that were already strongly rooted for us in our lives were able to transition to the yep. technology season a lot better, but forming new relationships and those things and uh, trying to build relationships off that. I, I don't think it's possible on technology alone in the same way that the interaction is. And it's a great tool to have, but it, it definitely yeah. does not replace. Yeah. Well, I mean, you think about, I mean, this right here, you know, we're, we're recording a podcast together, you know, I'm in Tennessee you're in California, you know, and that's really great, you know, that we can do that. But I, I feel like it would be even cooler if we were in the same room. You know what I mean? Like if we could do that, you know, if we could make that happen, you know, and be in the same room, you know, that would be even cooler. You know what I mean? But it, it's, you know, it, it has its place and I think it always will have its place. But I'm just, I'm wary of, I'm wary of, of 
people wanting to to make it the exclusive thing i'm like no it's just not it's not gonna work it's not gonna happen mm-hmm and a uh, for the for the fathers listening out there, I'm, I'm curious your take on technology in general for as it relates to to kids. Because I know people have different viewpoints on on this. What's you know what's the what are your fears around technology with mm. with your kids, and and kind of how do you use that as a way to again enhance their you know it's going to be if it's part of our lives, it's it's only going to be more and more a part of yeah. their lives. How do you you know get them prepared for that, but also uh, protect them against you know, some of the always staring down at a phone or an iPad or something. Yeah. yeah. And I, I could go on about this for many, many days <laughs> in, a, in a row, you know, without stopping, you know, with it, my time in youth ministry, you know, I was working with um, sixth through 12th graders, you know, I was working with teenagers. And so this is a, this is something that I've, you know, I've, I've studied, I've researched, I've talked a lot about, you know what I mean? With a lot of different people, but it, it's like a kind of, it's going back to what we just talked about. Like technology has its place. And I think, um, I think completely staying away from technology is, is kind of doing your kids a disservice as well, because we live in a technological world. That's just how it is, you know? And so if, if your kids are technologically illiterate, that's a disadvantage to them. But I would say my kids are foreign too. My kids don't need technology right now. You know what I mean? They don't, they don't need an iPad. They don't need they definitely don't need a phone. You know, they don't need, you know, they don't need any of this kind of stuff. You know, they don't need apps on, you know, and games. Like I don't care how educational the games are, you know, it doesn't matter to me. You know, they need to be using their motor skills. They need to be picking things up. They need to be throwing things. They need to be running. They need to be kicking. They need to be jumping and climbing and wrestling. And like, those are the things that my kids need to be doing. They need to be putting their hands on things and learning how to do that stuff. Um, And technology can come in later, you know, and I would say, Um, just my, my goal is to, is to not give my kids a phone until they're driving. I've got a long time before that, you know, I have no idea how that's So, you know, I'm not saying that's absolutely how it's going to go, but that's my goal. You know what I mean? And, and hopefully by then we'll still have dumb phones around where I, it doesn't have to have an internet connection. You know what I mean? And I can just flip it up and push my number in or something. Um, but, but man, there's just, um, again, I could go on about it all day, especially if your kids are teenagers, man, there's, there's things I, I wouldn't even say before then, like my, my wife sees stuff. She works in fourth grade. She teaches fourth grade, like the kids that she's working with nine and 10 year olds, you know, like there's just things out there that nine and 10 year olds don't need to be seeing. They don't need to be hearing. They don't need to be experiencing. And I, this isn't even from, I mean, obviously my Christian side you know it comes into this as well but like this is just literally just from a human um a human growing up standpoint like kids don't need to grow up knowing those things like there's there's certain points that you need to be before you're exposed to certain things and so i just think parents need to be very very careful with technology you know i think they need to be very very hesitant about what they bring into their homes i think they need to be very not just that but they need to be cognizant of technology's effect on them how much they're using it you know because like we've already talked about you know you're an example to your kids and if kids see you sitting there doing this all the time they're going to think it's normal and they're going to wonder why they don't get to you know what i mean like why do you get to look at your phone all day but i don't get to have one you know it's a and how do you answer that question well you keep that question from popping up, you know, and just don't let it affect you that way. I could go on about it, man, but I would just say, um, be very, very careful with it and very mindful of its effect on you, but also that there are things out there that you're not aware of and just be very, very careful with it, especially with kids, man, kids are really smart and kids figure this stuff out really, really quickly. You know, there are things that you and I did as kids that our parents didn't know about. You know, you find kids find ways to do things that they're not supposed to do. And they find ways to find out things they're not supposed to know. And just, I would just say, parents, just remember how you were as a kid and imagine what you would have done with, you know, this kind of technological stuff at your fingertips. Like, well, where would you have gone with this? And then just say, let's be careful with this. You know what I mean? That was a long, long explanation. Like I tried to trust me. I I pulled that down. I reined it in, man. I could go on about I, it. For I while. know you can go on with it, and I appreciate you. I, I, it was it was great, and I, I think just uh, you know what I took from that too is that I think we lose 
we kind of lose respect. We kind of lose awareness of how, of how powerful this technology really is. And yeah. I know I've, I've noticed it on our own lives and, and my wife, Lindsay, and I have been very, you know, vocal about this with just each other because we found out how much it creeps into our own lives and mm-hmm. how addicting social media specifically can be when, you know, especially as business owners, when we're trying to find that balance between yeah. interacting and being present in the world and being present for, you know, putting marketing for our business and, and making ourselves known yet also not letting it creep in and affect the relationships that are in front of us. So if it's, if it's that hard for us who I tend to consider us, um, you know, pretty aware people uh, for a, for a kid or a high school or even younger, if these kids are on social media and stuff, I can, I can see where there's dangers because it is powerful. It's, it's addicting. And not to say that again, I'm not, I'm not a social media is bad person. I I think it's a great tool, but I think being aware of, I think being aware of it is definitely something that, um, as parents, you need to be taken, taken charge of. Yeah. And I would, I would go back to, you know, kind of what I said earlier about, about a why, you know what I mean? Like go, go five whys deep on why, you know, your kid needs this piece of technology. You know what I mean? And, or, or if the, if your child is old enough, you know, go five wise deep on with them. You know what I mean? Like, you know, well, why do you want a phone? Well, everybody else has a phone. Well, why is it important for you to be like everybody else? You know what I mean? And start, start having some hard conversations, you know what I mean? And, and get them used to that. That's good for them too. You know, they need to know how to have hard conversations and hard answers and stuff. And I would just say, um, just be mindful of those things and, and have a good, have a good plan for it and just be wary. Um, like I said, um, I think it's a very powerful thing as well, but, but man, some of this stuff is it's, it's built to be addicting. You know what I mean? Like it's no, it's no surprise that it's addicting because it's designed that way. You know what I mean? And so just, just be mindful of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, if anyone's looking to go deeper on it, I haven't read a uh, Cal Newport's book, digital minimalism yet. I'm not sure if you checked that out, Kyle, but Mm-mm. I read his book, deep work and he, he starts to touch on it, but he wrote a new book, digital minimalism as well. That talks a lot about the addictions of social media and how to kind of move to more of this. And we're, a lot of us are familiar with the term minimalist and, and doing yeah. that from a, a digital standpoint. And I'm, his, his book's on my list though, but if people are looking to, for more resources on that too, I'd, I'd recommend looking his way. Yeah. I'll definitely check that one out too as well. Yeah. I want to circle back on something when you're talking earlier too, is a question I'd written down that I wanted to make sure I touched on more for my personal curiosity, because when you're talking about surrounding your kids with, with like-minded people and people that, you know, outside of your family unit that can help to, you know, grow and improve. And I think even for us personally, if you don't have kids surrounding yourselves around people who can help you grow and be in communities, a, mm-hmm. a really good practice to have. But I was kind of curious on your standpoint, because I've kind of wrestled with this internally myself of where's your balance between, you know, finding like-minded people, you want to find people who are you know, have similar goals and passions and purposes to push you yet find people who are different enough that give you, you know, challenge you maybe and, um, mm-hmm. you know, challenge your viewpoints. And uh, we can, we can speak on this. I think anyone listening can, can benefit from hearing this, but especially, you know, Christianity, I think it's accused sometimes of, it's like, well, Christians hang out with Christians and they're, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's this very secluded community. So how do you, how do you find this? I'm just, I'm just curious with all your background of, of between like-minded people and then yet still people that will challenge you and grow you in, in different ways. Where do you find that balance or anything you can speak on that specifically? Well, I'll say, I'll say this and man, you're asking a lot of good questions. I could, and I'm a talker, man, I could go forever, go for it. but um, I would say it, especially with, with the Christian side of it, um, Christianity is naturally evangelistic, right? And so we're supposed to be spending time around people who are not Christians, you know what I mean? And the reason for that is to share the gospel of Jesus with them, you know, like people who who have never heard of Jesus or who have not come to, you know, come to know him as their savior or or, or things like that. Like we're supposed to be spending time around those people, you know what I mean? Um, but at the same time, we should be understanding that we should not be expecting people who aren't Christians to act like Christians. Does that make sense? And I think that's where a lot of tension comes with, with people who are not Christians and people who are Christians is that I think the church has spent a long time 
um, expecting people who aren't Christians to act like Christians and holding them to the standards that Christians have submitted themselves to. And it's like, when you submit yourself to a standard, that's one thing and you should be accountable to that. But someone who has not submitted to that standard should not be held to that standard. You know what I mean? And I think that that applies no matter what, um, is it in surrounding yourself with people who do not think the way that you do, do not believe the way that you do or have, Maybe, maybe they do, but they have different viewpoints or perspectives on things. Like those things are good for, for human growth. And we need those things in our lives. But we have to remember that the standards that we have submitted ourselves to should not be forced on people. You know what I mean? And so when, when you're trying to surround yourself with people who think differently than you, you have to, as, as a person understand that subjecting them to your standards is putting them at a disadvantage and putting you at a disadvantage in that relationship. You know what I mean? And so you need to go into it openly of understanding, okay, this is where I stand. Somebody else stands somewhere else and that's okay. You know what I mean? And, but I can't be filtering everything that they say through where, what I am subscribing to. I need to try to understand from their side, and I need to try to somehow, you know, bring it around to where we can be on the same page. You know what I mean? Um, and I think a lot of that just starts with understanding that everybody's a human being and everybody deserves to be treated as a human being, you know, no matter what they think, no matter, you know, how you met them or, you know, whatever it they're, they're a human being. And so understand that. And you, you have that one thing in common, you know what I mean? So just go from <laughs> there, you know what I mean? But I, I think that's where we as individuals need to understand that when you're surrounding yourself with other people trying to grow, trying to push yourself, you know, if, if you put yourself in a position to be pushed, don't get upset when you get pushed. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. uh, if you put yourself in a position to grow, don't get upset when you're forced to grow. You know what I mean? Like understand that that's just part of it. That's part of the, part of the process. Yeah. I like a lot of that. And uh, a couple of things that, that stood out the first one, just, having intentionality around it, I think is something that's important of being, <clears throat> excuse me, being aware of, or I guess intentional of, you know, when you're surrounding yourself around, whether it's yourself or with your family, you know, being selective with, with who that is and not, right. not necessarily having to avoid any relationships. I think in, even outside of the, the Christian sphere, a lot of, you know, it's pretty widely accepted that the, the, you're the average of the people you spend the the five people you spend the most time with is right. a, just a, a popular self-help thing in general. So being mm -hmm. aware of that and trying to kind of level up in those areas, find where you're deficient, find where you want to grow and, and spend more time around those, but don't, don't get so pigeonholed in any, any one circle, I think is, right. is a, a pretty good rule of thumb. And, and I, I just, I like the, that's something that popped in my mind when you were, were talking about it too, where it's not avoiding anyone or anything, but it's also not trying to go into any, conversation necessarily with the goal of trying to change people either. Like you said, right. it's not trying to impose your, your beliefs on them. It's whatever your beliefs are. It's, and I think that's why there's so much division now too. And, mm -hmm. and not to get too deep on tangents, but mm -hmm. we talk mm -hmm. politics, we talk religion, yep. we talk anything. There's, there's these, we go into our interactions with like, how can I convert someone to my point of view versus how can I just connect with this person, actually yep. listen to what they're saying, empathize with and understand it and have an actual conversation that we can leave, maybe not agreeing, probably not agreeing, but, yeah. but leave, uh, you know, with mutual respect and, and having learned from it. Well, and maybe, maybe it's okay for us to disagree with each other. You know what I mean? <laughs> maybe that's, maybe that's good. I, I think it is good. You know, yeah. I think it's, I, I think it would be a really, really boring world if everybody thought the exact same thing and everybody did the exact same thing. You know what I mean? I think that's part of, that's part of what makes, makes life really, really great, you know, is having different perspectives and having different experiences and sharing those things with each other. You know what I mean? And, and I, I think there's something to be said with, with staying true to what you have devoted yourself to, you know what I mean? You know, don't, don't get, so surrounded by people that they pull you away from your principles you know what i mean be be who you are you know what i mean but also understand that um that going into a situation going into a relationship with with the express goal of forcing that person to change to your side 
you you've lost already, man. You know what I mean? You've already lost it. That if that's your motivation, you've already lost, man. It's just not going to happen. So, um, and and I think especially when it, this is something I was thinking of when you when you were talking about it was with with your kids of exposing your kids to those kinds of things. You know what I mean? I think you need to be really solid in making sure that you understand those perspectives and that you're very wary and very intentional of the the situations you're putting, not just you, but your family, you know, there, there are relationships that I can go have with people and conversations I can go have with people and things like that, that I'm prepared for, you know what I mean? As, as a, a grown person, you know, who, you know, has studied a lot of different things, has heard a lot of different perspectives. I can go do those things, you know, but like my four-year-old and my two-year-old, they, they need to be in a much, much smaller bubble right now. You know what I mean? And so I think that, exposing your kids to too much at once and i think it goes back to the technology thing too like exposing your kids to too much at once is is dangerous but you as it's just kind of what we've been talking about like you setting the example of being willing to listen to other things and being willing to maybe even change your mind on some things if you need to that's a good thing for your kids to see but i think you as the adult you as the parent you need to to be wary of what they're exposed to as well and keeping their bubble smaller than your bubble yeah, that's really good, Kyle. And I, I, I like just the the being example keeps keeps popping back up and whether yeah. that's in, you know, fitness and in leading and your family or whatever it is. But uh, in terms of a kind of segue here into the fitness side of things with being an example through garage gym athlete, I mean, you, you've been affiliated with them for, uh, you know, a few years now at this point, and it's, it's looking like a pretty good, uh, example to be, to be following with everything going on. Gyms are closing and there's so mm-hmm. much stuff going on. What do you, what do you see the future of, of fitness being? What do you see the future of, uh, garage gym athletes being in terms of where things are going? I, I think the the rogue sales can probably speak for themselves on, yeah. on one side of it, but I'd love to hear your yeah. thoughts on that as we start to wrap up here. Um, uh, you know, man, there's been, there's been a, a some form of, of, home gym athlete or garage gym athlete you know there's been some form of that for decades now you know for for a long long time people have been you know you look at all the all the different you know infomercial machines that have been sold over the years and you know dvd programs and all that kind of stuff you know and that that, that's been something that's been around for a long long time but i think over the last few years you know we've really seen it even before covid happened you know there was there was a big uptick in people um not just not like having a treadmill at home, you know, but like actually having like a gym, you know, having like uh, even, you know, commercial grade equipment at home, you know, and I think there was an uptick in that for years before COVID. I know into three fitness was, um, was started in 2011, you know, and I'm, I don't, I don't know that, that it was on the cutting edge, you know, of the garage gym athlete movement, but it was definitely close to the front. You know what I mean? Um, but you've seen, you know, those online programs, popping up all over the place. You know, it's like I said, when I first started trying to lose weight, you know, there was, there was a thousand different ones out there, you know, and you could pay for some, you could get some for free, you know, whatever, you know, you could find, you know, you could follow, um, you know, the CrossFit workout, the CrossFit website, you know, and they put out a workout every day, you know, you didn't have to do anything, you know, you just do whatever they put up. And, but I also think CrossFit really kind of normalized a lot of that as well. You know, I think, um, I don't, I don't want to bag too much on CrossFitters, but I just, you know, you, you start drinking that CrossFit Kool-Aid and, and all the cross, they want, they want all the same stuff that all the pros are using, you know, the games athletes, they want all the same stuff, you know, and the, the beauty of CrossFit is you can have the same stuff. You know what I mean? Anybody can buy anything from Rogue that they want to, you know, you can buy games used equipment from Rogue, you know, that after the games are over, they sell all that stuff that the, that the, the athletes actually use, you know, and, they sell the same shoes and the same apparel and the same, you know, weight, the bumper plates and all that kind of, and it's just, um, you see the, the top athletes in the, in CrossFit having not just a box, but they also have a gym at home where, you know, because they're, they're doing three or four workouts a day, you know, and not all of them are at the box. So they got to work out at home. And I just think, I think that, that that surge is still going. And I think it'll continue to go for a few years of, We'll, we'll still be seeing an uptick in people building gyms at their home, you know, and, and having that kind of equipment. And, but I also think that there's always going to be a place for commercial gyms. I don't see them, you know, completely fizzling out and 
being non-existent. I just don't see that happening. Um, I think there's always going to be, because I think there's a subset of the population that, that just really likes that gym experience. You know what I mean? The, you know, the, the, the gym bro, you know what I mean? They, that term is there for a reason, you know, because you go there with your friends, you know what I mean? And you make friends at the gym and, um, and that, and that's great. I think that's awesome. And so I think there's always going to be a place for commercial gyms. I hope so. I hope that they're pivoting, you know, now that they see, you know, some of the things that are going on. And um, I think some of them are, but I think there's always going to be a place for them. But I, I think we're going to continue to see for the next few years, uh, just that continuous uptick in people working out at home and it looking different than just having a treadmill that gets used for a couple months and then catches clothes for a couple years. You know what I mean? It's like, um, I think it's going to, it's going to be a little bit more serious. And, um, and I personally, I think people will find the convenience of it a lot, a lot bigger, you know what I mean? Than, than actually going to a gym and, and, you know, with COVID shutting gyms down, I mean, I know there's a lot of people hurting from that, not just people who work out there, but people who own those places, you know what I mean? That that's, that's a business, you know, that's a business that someone owns, you know, and they're getting hit really hard with all of this, but like, my gym's still open, you know what I mean? Like, and it never closed, you know, and I never had to slow down. Um, I never had to stop doing the program and never had to miss a workout, nothing, you know, um, it's getting cold and stuff. So I don't want to run outside anymore, but you know, that it's not because my gym's closed. It's cause I don't like running in the cold. You know what I mean? It's, but, um, I think it's, I think garage gyms are here to stay and I think they're going to be, um, we're going to continue to see that uptick for the next few years. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's I think it's a lot of good points, and I'm, I, I want to kind of give you guys a, a, a shameless plug here too because you guys do such a good job with it. But I, I think a big reason why people might stray away from garage gym type stuff too, or home gym type stuff, is because of a lack of community. How have you guys right. embedded community so strong into into your guys' community? And like, you want to speak on that just a little bit of how you've taken something that's that's a can be an isolating activity and, and made it into more of a you know, a group, a family, a, a community? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, as much as I've bagged on technology today, you know, when you're an online company, you depend exclusively on technology, you know, and so our community is online, you know, our, we have a private Facebook group for our members. We have a, a public Facebook group that we just have for anybody who's a garage team athlete, anybody that wants to join that, they can, they can join it. They don't necessarily have to be a paying member of our program. But that's something that, you know, and we have things within our business, you know, that we do specifically for the community of trying to make sure that we build that up. And, um, you know, we, we do four podcasts a week, you know, and that that's something that uh, one of those podcasts is an athlete of the week podcast, which we interview one of our members, one of our paying members um, on that podcast. And so our, our community of members gets to hear from one of their own, you know, every single week you know, and, uh, so they have, they have a podcast episode dedicated to them, a Facebook post dedicated to them, you know, before COVID hit, uh, we were doing, um, several, um, uh, we were doing a few, um, events together. We did, we ran some Spartan races together, um, with, uh, some, some trauma thrown in there from that. That's a story for another time, but yeah, we, we ran some Spartan races together, did some events. And I think that kind of also, helped people to kind of do that on their own. Like we have people that meet together and do events together, you know, outside of like official garage. Team. Like we, we officially met as garage team athletes and ran as a team, you know, in Spartan races, but then you have people who go and do events together on their own, or that's also, you know, push some people to actually just have that community at their house. You know what I mean? Like their, their neighbors see them out doing their thing and then they start inviting their neighbors over and their neighbors start working out, you know? And so, um, I know that's something and, you know, going back to CrossFit, that's something that CrossFit really depends on as well is that community aspect of it. You know what I mean? Of, you know, you're suffering, but you're suffering together. You know what I mean? And that's, that's how commercial gyms thrive as well is just having people that, um, that meet together at the gym and they do their thing. Um, but that's, that's the power of technology as well as we're able to have still have a really strong community of people that, that live all over the place. You know, we have, we have athletes all over the world, you know, not just in the, in the States. And, um, and so we get to connect in that way. And it's just, um, it's a really, really cool thing. 
Yeah, super cool. I think it's awesome what you guys are doing. So it's it's fun to see you guys from you know, observing it and and seeing how you guys have have grown through that and, and kept the community with it is is really cool to see. Yeah, this is actually this shirt right here is one of the things we get. You give people free t-shirts, and you know that's a good way to. Um, oh, this helps. Yeah, this is the this is our PR shirt. This the red one is for uh, five PRs. If you hit five PRs while you're on our program, and then you get a, a free red. Uh, PR shirt so you know you get you give stuff away to people you know and they they're like yeah I think I'll stick around you know what I mean yeah. it's kind of cool but you know you get you get to earn it you know like you can't buy this shirt anywhere you got to earn it and all that kind of stuff so you know we have stuff like that that builds community but like it's it's to the point now the community is just kind of perpetuating itself now you know what I mean and mm -hmm. it's uh it's a really really cool thing to see really cool thing to be a part of yeah no that's really cool Hey man, it's been a lot of good stuff here. As, as we start to tie it up, there's a few more questions I have here. Some of the final questions I ask the, the guests that come on. I've, I've already appreciated your, your vulnerability and I know we've already gotten outside of the, just the fitness, fitness box and, and get into, you know, faith and fatherhood and some of those different things. But I'm kind of curious for, you know, to, to hear where you're at on this question, because a lot of, you know, a lot of guys listening, we see, we see, myself speaking, we see the guests from the outside, we see these people who are doing these really cool things. And it's easy to look from the outside, again, dangers of social media and be like, you got it all together. These things are figured out, happy, happy families, staying fit, uh, you know, working with multiple businesses, very successful businesses. And it's, it's easy to look from the outside and, and think that you have it all together, that I have it all together, that we, mm -hmm. we have all things figured out. And, and I think we'd both be the first to admit that that's definitely not the case. Not but, at all. Uh, <laughs> not, not at all. And, uh, you know, because of that, I, I think that's, that actually poses a danger for people listening because I know personally, and where this question tends to strike home is that, you know, early on when I was making it through school and PT school and, you know, playing college football and doing these things, it was always looking to, you see these, these images of people and whether it's pro athletes, whether it's people you look up to and it's, it's, these people always have it all together. They got to figure it out. These people are doing more in, in business. These people are doing more in their, whatever their passions are. And, and I, I think that's a dangerous place to be because it creates mm -hmm. insecurities. It creates these false stories that aren't really real around, uh, people have flaws. We have these things we struggle with. Right. And if, if you don't mind sharing with, with listeners, something, you know, a challenge you faced recently, or maybe something you're still actually going through now, that's uh, been, been challenging, but actually been a, a catalyst for your growth as a man. You know, man, I actually am all put together. So, you know, everything's <laughs> Next good. Question. I don't have any, I don't have any, problem. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll be honest, man. Um, stepping away from ministry was, uh, was a really difficult thing. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, like I said, you know, I just, I just saw the opportunity, you know, the opportunity to provide better for my family ministers, you know, are not, not very highly paid, you know what I mean? And, and I married a teacher, you know, they're not very highly paid either, you know, and um, honestly, man, I don't, I don't care one bit about money. You know what I mean? If I didn't need money to live, you know, if my kids didn't need money to live, I wouldn't care to have a dime of it. You know what I mean? I would do whatever I wanted to do and never expect anybody to, to give anything back. You know what I mean? But but th that's the truth of it. You know, I, I need money to live. My kids need money to live. My wife needs a, a, a place to live. You know what I mean? And so that, that opportunity to, to provide better, you know, presented itself. And I just felt like, you know, I felt like as a man, like that was my, you know, I had to at least consider it. You know what I mean? I, it, it was something that I had to, to, to really wrestle with and really make a decision on. And it wasn't something that I made lightly, you know what I mean? But I think the nature of ministry um, and maybe this was just my own, you know, insecurities coming up, but I think the nature of ministry is it, it seems like it's something that, that you should do once you get into it, that you should do it for the rest of your life, you know, and if you don't do it for the rest of your life, then you're a failure. You know what I mean? You, you failed at ministry. And I, I think I just, I had to come to grips with, um, the fact that I, I, there's still plenty of ministry out there for me to do, you know what I mean? And all of us do, you know, and, and ministry is just, uh, you know, it actually, you know, overseas, you know, there's minister doesn't necessarily refer to Christians, you know, it doesn't necessarily refer to a church, you know what I mean? It could just be uh, an executive, you know what I mean? It could just mean somebody who's in charge of something. And so, but, but ministry, I think the nature of it, at least here in, in the South, you know, where I come from, um, it seems like it's something you're supposed to do for life. And if you don't do it, then you failed at it. And I had to come to grips with all of us are ministers in some way. You know what I mean? We're, we're all 
ministering in some way. We're all an example to somebody, you know, we're all showing somebody how to do something, whether for good or for bad, we're all showing. And, and really ministry is mostly just building relationships. You know what I mean? It's just, um, getting to know somebody and trying to help them with whatever they're going, going through. You know what I mean? That's really what ministry is about. And there's still plenty of it that I can do that if I'm not in a full-time capacity and actually, um, not being a full-time minister, um, who's employed by a specific congregation can actually open me up and free me up to do more than I was able to do. You know, if I'm, if I'm willing and, and courageous enough, you know, to take those opportunities. And so, um, there was a lot, a lot of good that I, I really enjoyed my time as a minister, you know, and I really enjoyed my time doing it full time, but I can still minister going forward. And that was just something that I had to grapple with. You know what I mean? It, like, what are people going to think of me? What are people going to say? You know, what, how am I going to justify this? You know, is it really that I, I want to make more money? And so I'm leaving this job, you know, it's when it boils down to it, you know, when you say it like that, it sounds really bad, you know what I mean? But it's like, when it boils down to it, you know, it's like, my family needs it, you know what I mean? And that's, that's my why for everything is, is my family, you know? And so if that's what they need, then that's what I'm going to do. So I think that was the, that was probably the biggest thing that I've struggled with recently was just, you know, am I a failure at ministry for stepping away to do something different? And it's like, I'm only a failure if I stop ministering, you know what I mean? Mm. And there's still plenty of ministry left for me to do, even if it's not in a full-time capacity. Did you wrestle with that? Cause it was a, an identity thing of, of something that you had, had just tied yourself to, or is it more the perception of what other people would think of you? I'm getting, and maybe some combination of both. I think it was a little bit of both. Honestly, it really was. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't even go into my, my, uh, journey through college, but like my, I, I've had multiple jobs in my life. I went to multiple colleges to get there. You know what I mean? Like that's just the, the short end of it. But, um, you know, my degree, is you know the degree the only degree that I actually finished was in ministry. It was in ministry and Bible, and so it's like, well, I put this time into getting a degree. It only applies to one thing, you know. So, you know, what do I do now? And and part of it was an identity identified as as a minister and being a Christian. It, it's like all of that's wrapped up into one thing. You know what I mean? And so, like, am I? am I a bad Christian if I decide not to be a minister anymore? You know? And so part of it really was identity and part of it was perception. Like, like I said, you know, like some people think, well, you need to do it for life or you failed at it, you know, or, you know, what are these people going to think of me if, if I decide to not do this anymore, you know, what are these teenagers that I've been working with, you know, I love them to death, you know, and they, they love me and they, they're a really big part of my life. You know, I'm not going to see them anymore, you know, cause I go to a different church, you know, we don't work together. Or I don't work, you know, trying to minister to them anymore. Like, what's that going to be like? And there was just a lot of stuff that went into it, you know. And, um, but I just really, I, I kind of had to do that thing, you know, of drilling down deep, you know, and figuring out what's the real motivation here. You know what I mean? And ultimately, I just found that it's, it, it's the best, it's the best decision for my family. And that's, you know, ultimately, uh, hope, I, I really don't think anybody can fault somebody for that you know what i mean like i wouldn't fault anyone else for that you know what i mean of um you're making the best decision that you can make for someone else on behalf of someone else that's your responsibility so you you do your thing you know but but yeah it was a it was a struggle and mm -hmm. uh, but you know i came out on the other side and and actually have found a lot of the skills that i developed as a minister have translated really well to my new position um, you know, what, what I do with PT biz, it's a lot of, it's a lot of relationship stuff. It's, you know, managing people, it's, you know, interacting with people, you know what I mean? And it's, it's like, you know, I, I found that, that a lot of the stuff I was doing as a minister, it translates really well to what I'm doing now. So it's like, I, I didn't really have a whole lot to worry about, you know, and mm -hmm. that's kind of how it works out. I think most of the time. Well, brings a full circle as, uh, yep. as the door closes or at, whether we choose to yep. close the door, whether it closes on us, you know, other doors open and new opportunities and excited to see where that, that next chapter leads you as well. Yeah, absolutely. And a few of the, just, and I know we just keep having good conversation, like as we wrap <laughs> up, but I, I want to just keep going into it, but to three of the takeaways, I, I, I jotted down quite a few things, but a few of the things that kept popping up, uh, as we summarize here, you know, finding your why, connecting to something deep down within you and going, like Kyle said, five whys deep is a good way to do it. Uh, one thing I would add to that too is just find a why that connects with you and not something that just 
sounds good or you think people want to hear right. find that, right. that why that really resonates with you. Uh, the second thing, the importance of living in community and especially of, you know, like-minded people or people, uh, you know, with the same passions, the same goals, the same direction that you're heading to not just surround yourself with, but especially your family with to be, uh, to be a good, good role model for them. And the last thing that kept popping up for me was, you know, be an example, living as that example, whether that's, you know, with mm -hmm. things we touch on, like our, our faith as you know, with technology, with fitness, with whatever it is to, to make sure we're living it out and not just telling, telling our kids or our employees or someone, one thing, and then turning around and, and doing the opposite thing. So right. those were three things that, that, uh, kept jumping out to me. Is there anything you want to add to that, Kyle? No, man, you made me, uh, made me sound really smart. You made me sound like I, I said some really good stuff. <laughs> did say some good stuff. So <laughs> final question, actual final question here before we wrap right. up our hypothetical scenario. So I ask all the guests here. So we say you're leaving a you know favorite coffee shop in town. You bump into your younger self. So younger Kyle of 10 years back, younger Kyle asks current you for some life advice, looking for some, some guidance. You're on your way to an important thing with your family. You only have 60 seconds to talk with him. What life advice are you giving to him? What are you saying to him? Man, I, I thought about this question a lot. It's really difficult. Um, it, it would take a it would take a super important meeting for me to not sit down and have a conversation with twenty year old <laughs> me. You know what I mean? Like I feel like I would just cancel the meeting. You know what I mean? Um, but but I would try to find twenty year old Kyle um, had a lot of stuff ahead of him, right? And actually, I just I just turned thirty this month, and so. Um, uh, turning 30, I don't feel older per se, but I feel more introspective. And so I just, it kind of dawned on me for the first time that an entire decade of my life is gone. You know what I mean? And this question brought that back up of, you know, that front number of my age has changed, you know, and that only changes, you know, every now and then. And so 20 year old me would have a whole lot ahead of him. And there's a whole lot that happened to me, the whole lot of changes that I went through in my twenties leading up to where I am now. And, but I think the biggest thing that 20 year old me would need to know is that he has a lot of decisions that he's going to have to make. Um, he's going to have a lot of uncertainty and he's going to meet a lot of things that he's not prepared for and didn't foresee um, that his life is a whole lot different than he expects it to be. And that's good because it's a whole lot better than he thinks it's going to be. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil it for him, you know, not going to tell him, you know, you know, who he winds up marrying, you know, or where he winds up living or doing or anything, you know, I'm not going to do that, but just that life is not what he expects it to be right now. And, but that because of all of that, the one thing that he needs to do is to continually just trust in the Lord, just trust in God, because there's opportunities that he doesn't foresee that there's there's a path that's gonna that he's gonna have to follow um that he's not that he's not ready for and there's only one way that he's going to make it and that's through trusting in, in god and letting god help him make those decisions because that's what i did you know the, these opportunities came up these aren't things that i just that i just made on a whim you know oh well let's hope this works out you know that's just not i don't live my life that way you know like i have something that, that I do trust in. I trust in, in, in God and, and I stay connected to him regularly. And, um, I think that's why I'm ready and prepared when opportunities come along. It's not because of something, because I'm so wonderful or amazing, you know, or great at what I do. It's because I'm connected to the source of all of that. And, you know, again, some people don't believe that and that's fine, but like be, be connected to something that, that is bigger than you, but I would just tell 20 year old me, Hey, you got a lot coming up that you're not ready for. I'm, I don't even have time to explain to you what's going to happen. But the one thing you need to know is, is to trust in him and let him guide you through those things. Cause they're big decisions. And honestly, man, the only way you're going to make it through it is, is to trust in him. <laughs> Cause it's, if it's up to you, man, you're going to mess it all up. So uh, just trust in him and you'll, you'll, you'll get where you need to go. Love it, Kyle. Good, good wisdom and happy birthday to you at 30. You have a lot more wisdom on your, uh, <laughs> under your belt now, right? At the, yeah. the change of a decade. So, yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's funny to look back and think about 20 year old me and I, I don't know how I made it, but you know, that's it. Like I, I, I made it for through divine intervention. That's the only way I can explain it. That, that's how I'm here.
Yeah. Funny thing is you'll look 10 years back and you'll be thinking probably a lot of the same thing. So it's, I'll say it's, the same thing. I'll <laughs> listen to this episode 10 years from now, you know, when yep. I turn 40 and I'm going to be like, man, that dude was stupid. What's he thinking? Like, <laughs> should have said, like, should have said this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, man. Hey, let's, uh, let's let people know where they can find you in a few different places. Make, make your, uh, make your, uh, plugs where you need to there. I know you got a lot of things going on. So we'd love to be able to share that with people. Well, um, personal, Social media, it's just uh, Kyle Shrum on Facebook and then uh, Kyle Shrum on Instagram. That's K-Y-L-E-S-H-R-U-M, all put together, all lowercase, nothing fancy about it. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, at Garage Team Athlete. Come over and check us out, garagetomathlete.com. We got programming. Um, I, I'm actually the one coach over there. So, like, if you sign up for our coaching tier, then you get to talk to me and I – you know, I get to walk you through our training and, you know, we do nutrition plans and stuff like that too. Um, and then, you know, uh, the main job, the full-time job, PT biz, you know, if you're a physical therapist out there looking for, you know, some coaching, some, some help getting off the ground or getting moving in the right direction business wise, you know, that's what we do. That's what we specialize in. So come and, uh, come and find us and, and talk to us and let's see what we can do to help you out. Awesome, Kyle, man. I had an absolute blast with you, with you on here. So I yeah, appreciate man. you taking time and appreciate you coming on for this. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, it was good to be here. Good to just kind of talk about a lot of stuff and just see where it goes. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad to have gotten to be here, man. Good yeah. Times. Yeah. Good stuff. And I appreciate you sharing with the listeners. So we'll talk soon, man. And uh, thanks for coming on. All right, buddy.